Well, this morning, I want to um, continue where uh, Ken Johnson left off in Sunday school. I mean, this is only, only can be orchestrated by the Holy Spirit. Uh, I didn't ask Ken to, to teach Sunday school and probably until Thursday uh, of this week, and he had no idea what I was going to speak on this morning. So I, I think it's safe, safe to assume that the Lord has a message for us, something that he wants us to learn, and in learning, he wants us to walk in it. This morning, I want to speak to you about the power of unity, the power of unity in the body of Christ. We'll be going to Ephesians chapter 4, verses 1 through 6. On the back of a U.S. dollar, there's a variety of artwork there, but in particular, there is the great seal of the U.S. of America. It was adopted by the Continental Congress in 1776, and this seal depicts a, an eagle rising uh, with an olive branch in its right talon and a bundle of arrows in its left. It has a shield with 13 vertical stripes, which represent the original 13 colonies, and there is a canopy over the head of the eagle with 13 stars, which also re represents the original colonies of the United States of America. The inscription in Latin is E Pluribus Unum, E Pluribus Unum, which means out of many, one, out of many, one. That motto, out of many, one, is certainly being put to the test in the United States of America. It appears more often than not, we are not the United States of America, but the divided states of America. But in the church, E pluribus unum, should be our motto, out of many, one. Oneness, unity. We are a many-membered body with a variety of different callings and gifts and talents and ministries which are to be used for the glorification of God. They are given to us by God and they are to be used for the glorification of God. Also, if you think about the Pledge of Allegiance to the United States of America, right? Uh, it is the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, that means with unity, inseparable, with unity, with liberty and justice for all. However, it's obvious, uh, unless you live with your uh, head in the ground, uh, we are a deeply divided nation. We are divided on, on political lines, religious lines, racial lines, social economic lines, gender lines, even these days. Uh, we, may be divided, we may even live in divided homes, and some here may even have divided hearts, wavering between serving the Lord or serving their own desires. A prime example of the division of the United States is the debate over or not we should build a wall on our border. Another vivid example of political dividedness in the United States is the, when we see the diagram during election time of the United States uh, with the blue states and the red states, right? You have a couple blue states on this side, a couple blue states on this side, and red in between them for the most part and that depicts the Republicans and the Democrats. Um, I believe that really, truly, uh, more and more, I see that the struggle between who's in power, who's in control politically, isn't really uh, Democrats and Republicans, but it's the globalists who want to bring us into a one world government uh, versus the patriots, those who believe in the Constitution of the United States of America, who uphold the Constitution and believe in the sovereignty of our nation, that we are one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Um, I don't know how much longer, to be honest, we will be able to maintain our republic. Jesus said, every city or house divided against itself shall not stand. But he also said in Matthew 12, 25, every kingdom divided against itself is brought to desolation. Every kingdom is brought to desolation. With all the strife, with all the factions and contentions in the world today, it is essential for the body of Christ as a whole, and much more importantly, in the local church, that we do not adopt the spirit of the age which is division. We cannot, we dare not 
adopt the spirit of division. We as Christians, Christian brethren, must not descend into disunity and division in the church. Local churches cannot afford to be torn apart uh, by the very people that God has redeemed by his blood and he, that he has planted within the local body. Isaiah 61.3 says that we are the trees of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he may be glorified. Psalm 92.12 says the righteous shall flourish like a palm tree. He shall grow up like a cedar in Lebanon. Those that are planted, be planted in the house of the Lord, shall flourish in the courts of our God. They shall still bring forth fruit in old age. They shall still be fat and flourishing. And Jesus, if we turn to John 17, we're going to be going back and forth between John 17 and Ephesians 4. I want to show, when I speak about the power of unity, I want to talk about what unity is, what it is not, how do we get it, how do we maintain it, and what are the benefits of unity, the power of unity. In John 17, Jesus delivers his high priestly prayer. It is the longest recorded prayer of Jesus in the scriptures. Jesus petitions the Heavenly Father about the oneness or the unity of believers in Christ. Jesus, as prior to his arrest, this is right before his arrest, he offers up intercession for his disciples and for those that would come after them. He knows that his time is short. He knows that he's going to the cross. His arrest and crucifixion are nigh, but he takes the time to pray for his disciples and all those that would believe and come after him, after them in the future because of their testimony. This prayer has no expiration date. This prayer is still active and living and powerful today as when it was first uttered 2,000 years ago. John 17, verse 20. Let's pick up there. Jesus praying, Neither pray I for those alone, for his disciples alone, but for them which will shall believe on me through their word, that they all may be one, as thou, Father, art in me, and I am in thee, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that you have sent me, and the glory which you gave me I have given them, that they may be one, even as we are one, I and them and you and me, that they may be made perfect in one, in unity, Christ in us, the hope of glory, that the world may know that you have sent me and have loved them as you have loved me. Earlier in this passage in John 17, 11, he says that they may be one as we are one. Jesus prayed that God the Father would unify everyone who believes in him. Jesus prayed that every believer throughout the ages would live and walk in unity with him and the Father and with one another. He also, by walking in unity, that the world would observe the oneness of the brethren, that the world would see their love for one another, that the world would be convinced that Jesus Christ is the Savior of the world because we walk in unity and love with one another. One of the crowning jewels of the church is unity in Christ. Jesus taught in John 13, 34, a new commandment I give unto you, that you love one another as I have loved you, that you also love one another. And by this, he said, shall all men know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. Jesus said that our unity and our love for one another would be a sign to the world that we are his disciples, true disciples and disciples indeed. Someone once asked Gandhi, the spiritual leader of India, what is the greatest hindrance to, the, to Christianity in India? And his response was, Christians. Christians. That's the biggest hindrance. I suspect that he probably said that was because of our lack of love for one another and our lack of unity. Jesus qualifies how we are to love one another. He says, as I have loved you. 
In John 15, 12, he says, This is my commandment that you love one another as I have loved you. What does that mean? Well, he tells us, Greater love has no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends, and you are my friends if you do whatsoever I command you. So Jesus qualifies what it means to love and how to love and how we are supposed to love one another, that his, our joy would be full and that we would be a witness and a testimony to the world around us, but he also qualifies what it means to be a friend. You know, we may have a friend in Jesus, but would Jesus call us his friend? Well, if we are keeping his commandments, it proves that we love him and that we are indeed his friend. So what is unity? What is the grounds for unity? What are the blessings of unity and how do we maintain that unity? One thing, unity is not uniformity. Unity is not uniformity. Unity is not conforming to some arbitrary rules or restrictions, um, commandments, not, not arbitra arbitrary, right? I'm not talking about the commandments of the scriptures. I'm talking about outside rules. For instance, I'm sure you probably have all seen uh, uh, Mormons uh, in your neighborhood or maybe some other neighborhood, and you can see who they are because of their uniformity, right? Their uniform. The white dress down shirts, the black slacks, and the black tie riding on their bicycles, right? That's uniformity. Unity comes from within. Unity is a work of grace through the Holy Ghost. Unity is a work of grace through the Holy Ghost, through the Holy Spirit. Unity comes from an understanding that we are all in this together, right? We're all in this together. It is a spiritual grace. While uniformity, conformity, comes to us because it's pressure put on us from the outside. Something from the outside and not from within. It is an act of the Holy Spirit. It is an act of the conviction of the Holy Spirit convicting us concerning sin righteousness and the judgment to come. Um, my wife and I, some time ago, we saw an interesting film, uh, The Resurrection of Gavin Stone. Anyone see that Christian film? Yeah, a couple. It was, it was a cute film. But in that film, the, the fellow, he uh, has to do community work at a church, and so he begins to hang around the church, and they invite him to church, and he's like, uh, yeah, sure, and he pretends to be a Christian. Yeah, I'm a Christian. Sure, I'll come. And so he goes to Google and looks up, well, you know, what does it mean to go to church? What do I need to do? And so you see him in the next scene. He's got uh, khaki pants on, a dress down shirt. He's got a comb over, you know, how to dress for church. He's got a Bible in his hand, you know, completely out of character of who he was before. When they pass the communion plate like we did today, he grabs a handful, thinking, wow, they serve snacks here. But... It, Again, unity isn't about conforming to some rules or restrictions, but it's about us conforming to the Holy Spirit, walking in unity. Unity is not sameness, okay? Unity is not sameness. Unity is diversity. Diversity. It is, it is us as distinct individuals, right? Distinct individuals going in the same direction to accomplish the same goal. Right? We all have different gifts and callings and talents and ministries, but we are unified by the blood of Jesus Christ, hopefully going with the same goals, the same direction, the same vision, the same purpose. That's what unity is all about. Uh, to the glory of God. You know, Paul uses um, the idea of unity in, in 1 Corinthians uh, 12. You don't have to um, turn there, but we probably all know when he talks about us being members of the body, Right? And there's uh, different parts of the body with different um, objectives or different, uh, different senses. He talks about seeing and hearing and all those things. We, we're different, but yet we're part of one body, one body, one body. Ephesians 4.15, Paul tells us the same kind of idea, 4.15 and 16. He says, we are speaking the truth in love that we may grow up in him in all things, which is the head, even Christ. He goes on to say, from whom the whole body fitly joined together and compacted by that which every joint supplies, 
according to the effectual working in the measure of every part, makes increase of the body unto the edifying of itself in love. So here it is, the whole idea is that each of us as members of a local body of believers are ministering and serving one another in love for the edification, for the growth of each other in love, that we would grow in the grace and the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul in Corinthians 12 even talks about that there's different gifts and different ministries. He goes in 12, 29, are all apostles, are all prophets, are all teachers, are all workers of miracles? The answer to each one of those is no, they're not all the same. We're all different, distinct individuals walking in the same direction. Each part of the body is different from the others. Each has a different function, yet we are one. E pluribus unum. And we are to work together toward a common goal for the glory of God. It would be like, you know, an orchestra. If you think of an orchestra, all the different instruments in an orchestra, the, the wind sections or, or the uh, uh, string sections and percussion and all that, so forth, they each have a different sound. They're very distinct in their sound and they're very distinct in what they do and what they play. Uh, and they can play as individuals and sound uh, beautiful. But when they come together as an orchestra with the same piece of music, right, all on the same page, right, playing the same song, they can sound wonderful and beautiful. That is unity, distinct, coming together, while playing music from the same page, the same song, and it's a beautiful thing. Unity is not person-driven. Unity is not person-driven except for the person of the Lordship of Jesus Christ. Unity is purpose-driven. It is working together with the same goal, same purpose, same vision to the glory of God. And Paul even dealt with that in the early church. In 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 1, verse 11 He's dealing with contentions and strife and envy within the church. And he talks about this. He says, uh, you know, there are contentions among you in verse 11. He says that he's heard of contentions. In verse 12, he says, now this I say that every one of you says, I am of Paul, and I am of Apollos, and I am of Peter, and I am of Christ. He asks, is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Or were you baptized in the name of Paul? I thank God I baptized none of you except for maybe a couple of guys, Crispus and Gaius, lest any of you should say I have baptized you in my own name. Right? We're baptizing in the name of Jesus. This He continues on two chapters later with the same thought, 1 Corinthians 3.3, 3, For are you not carnal? For as there is among you envying and strife and divisions, are you not carnal and a walk as men? For while one says, I am of Paul, and another one says, I am of Apollos, are you not carnal? Who then is Paul, and who is Apollos? But ministers by whom you believed, even as the Lord gave to every man. I have planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. So then, neither is he that plants anything, and neither is he that waters, but God who gives the increase. Now he that plants and he that waters are one. Unity and oneness. And every man shall receive his own reward according to his own labor. For we are laborers together, unity, with God. You are God's husbandry, and you are God's building. So he makes it very clear that the only personality that matters is the personality, the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. Grounds for unity. What are the grounds for unity? How can we walk in unity? There has to be some kind of ground rules. Well, unity in the church is based on submission. Submission. Submission to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. Right? We have to be submitted to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. Submission to the Scriptures. We have to be submitted to the Scriptures, that the Bible is the final authority of all matters of faith and conduct. The Scriptures. And submission to one another. The Bible tells us that we are supposed to be submitted to one another in the fear of God. Submitted to the Lordship of Jesus Christ, submitted to the Scriptures, and submitted to one another in the fear of God. 
For there to be unity, it must be built on the truth, the truth of the Lord Jesus Christ, but the truth of the scriptures as well. Right? In order for us to walk in any kind of unity, it has to be based on the truth. We have to be believing and accepting the truth, reality, objective truth as it is. You know, Jesus said to those Jews who believed on him, if you continue in my word, then you are my disciples indeed. And you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Walking in the truth. We have to be those that are committed to the truth. <laughs> Committed and submitted to the truth, the truth of the scriptures, that the Bible is the final authority for all matters of faith and conduct. Uh, recently, I had an, uh, an opportunity to speak to a young person, and uh, not from here, but a young person that I know very well, and we were speaking about the idea of truth, and they were trying to give me uh, the falsehood that truth is relative. So we were going back and forth about that, and I began to thought, well, perception is relative. You might have a different perspective, but the truth is absolute. The truth stands alone in and of itself. The truth is objective, right? Objective, it stands in and of itself. And so we went back and forth, back and forth. And so I so happened to have a empty two-liter bottle of Diet Coke in my hand. I don't know where that came from. But so I, I took it and I bopped her on the knee with it. She's like, hey, don't hit me. I said, I didn't hit you. And Chris was there. I said, Chris, did you see me hit her? No, I didn't see you yeah. hit her. I just blew her argument completely <laughs> apart. I mean, that was my point. The truth is objective. It stands in and of itself. The truth is the truth. It is reality. It is real. And so I think she saw what I was getting at. Jesus also said in John 17, 17, uh, sanctify them by thy truth. Thy word is truth. He wants to sanctify us by the word of God, the truth. He wants to take the law that is written on these pages, and he wants to write it in our hearts and put it in our minds, sanctification. Yeah, as you have sent me into the world, he says, even so I have sent also them into the world, and for their sakes I sanctify myself, that they also might be sanctified through the truth. There may be differences of opinion and differences uh, of methodology, but in order to have any kind of unity as far as the body of Christ, we have to believe the essential foundational doctrines of the Christian faith. Right. And for us to build on anything else is sinking sand. Right. To build on anything else and the truth of the scriptures is sinking sand. <clears throat> Again, we can only have unity in the body of Christ if it is based on submission to the authority of the scripture. The scripture is the final authority of all matters of faith and conduct. Now, we can build with other Christians, or we can enjoy other Christians. I mean, we go to Camp Kobiak, that is a Christian camp, but I'm sure that they do not believe all the things that we believe to be true and hold to be true in their camp. Many of you have your children in uh, Christian schools, and I'm sure that many of those schools do not believe the same things that you believe according to the Scripture. So we can fellowship with one another. Uh, we can maybe even be involved with one another to a, a certain point, but if we're going to be truly uh, committed to something, a true vision, perspective, purpose, we have to agree on the scriptures in every, every aspect. Basically, we have to agree. Um, so the local church, we have to, uh, we must be in agreement with the, the purpose and the vision and the direction in which we're going. Right? We have to be in agreement with the purpose, direction, and vision in which we are going. Otherwise, someone's going to veer off this way or that way. Um, quite interesting. So we can work together up to, uh, with other Christians to a certain point, uh, but sometimes that breaks down because uh, different visions, right? A different vision, we might say, oh, they're in a different stream. And some of the verses that we might use, they're Christians. We don't doubt their Christianity. We don't doubt their salvation. But um, they have uh, maybe some different perspectives on some of the scriptures, so they're in a different stream. Uh, years ago, um, I, I live uh, between uh, two schools. Uh, I have, uh, within uh, two blocks, I have a high school at one end, and then I have a junior high at the other. 
And in fact, if I would have looked at the house um, during school time, uh, September through May, I probably would not have bought it because it's very difficult to get out of your driveway between 7 and 7.30 in the morning because high school starts at one time, junior high starts 15 minutes later. But anyways, and one of the things that I like to do in the summertime in nice weather is I will go and I will greet and I will pass out tracks to the high school students. Um, I will pass out, I've passed out water bottles and that sort of thing where I have a little, a little um, flyer uh, or track about uh, the water of life and then, then it brings up Jesus being the water of life. Um, and I pass these out to the students as they are getting out of class. Well, one of the things that over the course of the years, uh, one of the things that Ben would do, Ben, our son, he would, uh, at, at that time, he would hang out at the park and he would do parkour. Uh, ended up breaking his femur doing that. But one of the things he would also do, he would go to the park and some people bring home stray pets, stray dogs, stray animals. He would bring home stray people. And I never knew <laughs> what I was walking into. There would be a whole group of people that I'd never seen before. It's like, ah, oh, you know, eating ice cream sitting in my living room. And like, who are you and why are you eating my ice cream? But uh, one of the fellows that he, he brought home was a, a guy by the name of Fong. And Fong uh, lived in a neighborhood. He went to the high school, and uh, he was a, Bu a Buddhist. Um, he was a Buddhist, and we, you know we talked about that a little bit. But one of the things, uh, so one day I'm out there at the high school passing out tracks, and he knew me. He'd been in my home eating my ice cream. Um, he said, "Oh, he was coming out of high school. What are you doing?" I said, "Well, I'm passing out Christian literature." He goes, "Oh, I'll help you." So here I am. Me and the Buddhist <laughs> passing out Christian tracts, right? Now, that relationship can only go so far because there's a huge difference there. He wanted to help me. I figured here's a kid that goes to the high school. He knows other high school kids. It's probably a good thing. So we can build um, relationships with others, but they can only go to a certain point, Right. Uh, years ago, um, one of the things that we do and we're planning, for those of you who have a, a youth in high school, you should find some literature in your mailbox about going down to the wilds, the wilds campground. And, and they promote themselves as, um, as a um, non-denominational campground, but they are really, truly Baptists at heart. And uh, one of the times we were down there, um, they have uh, breakfast with all of the, the sponsors, those of us that drive kids down to the camp. And so we're sitting there and uh, all sitting at a long table, one of those eight-foot tables, and they went around saying, oh, where are you from? And so it was from First Baptist, Faith Baptist, Second Ebenezer Baptist, so on and so forth. And they got to us, where are you guys from? Oh, we're from Calvary Christian Church. And actually one of the ladies said, Christian? Yes. Christian. <laughs> Baptists fall under that heading. Right? We can only go so far uh, in our relationship. We can enjoy fellowship with one another. We can enjoy camp with one another. But we're not going to build anything of any significance with one another because of our differences. Um, one time, many years ago, I, my wife and I, we were attending uh, Sunday evening. We had to go buy tickets for something at a, a, a local Baptist uh, church. And uh, at the end of service, the uh, pastor, they had, um, it was an evening service. At the end of service, they had uh, visitor cards that people had filled out that morning. And um, visitor cards, and uh, they had them up front, and they were asking people from their congregation to come and take some visitor cards to go visit those people throughout the week. You know, keep that interaction going. And I whispered to my wife, I'm going to go up there and grab some cards and see what they say. <laughs> because they knew me quite well, and they knew that we were not in the same stream. <laughs> Anyways, unity. We must be willing to submit to the truth of the scriptures, submit to the lordship of Jesus Christ, and submit to one another in the fear of God. You know, I've been praying for quite some time for 300 men, and not 300 men just to fill the, the pews, but what I call them fats company. 300 men that are faithful, available, teachable, and submit it and commit it to one another in the fear of God. And that's what we really need. So how are we going to walk in this unity? What is the reality of walking in the unity? Well, first off, Ephesians 4, jumping ahead of myself a little bit, Ephesians 4, 
verses 4 through 6. In order for us to walk in unity, the Apostle Paul spells it out for us. There is one body. There is one spirit. Even as you are called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in all. So here he lays it out, the things that we must believe in order to live and walk in this unity. Again, there may be differences of opinion, differences of uh, methodology, but in order for us as a local church, there has to be some agreement with the vision and direction of the church. And Paul likens us, you know, one God and one Father of all, who is above all and through all and in you all. And truly, that is the marvelous, a marvelous depiction of oneness of believers, that we are all a part of the family of God, right? We are all a part of the family of God, for God is over all, he is working through us all, and he is in all of us. We are the children of God. We are in the same family, and hoping, hoping that we are in the same family, that we are loving and serving the same Father, and loving and serving one another, therefore we can walk in unity with each other. Just as an earthly family has uh, different folks living in it, with different personalities, different likes, dislikes, um, cause and ministries and so on, we have to be able to work together according to the same goal. You know, Jesus' prayer, he taught his disciples how to pray, and the first thing he says is, Our Father. Our Father. And sometimes you have to ask yourself, how big is your hour? <laughs> you know, how far does it go? How far does it expand? Uh, during the Christmas holiday, Chris and I had an opportunity to visit some some old friends that we haven't seen for probably, I don't know, 10 years or more. And it was uh, good to see them. I think we were probably um, maybe useful or helpful in leading them to the Lord uh, way back when. And one guy was up from Atlanta with his family. Um, but we got together and we were able to talk with one another. And we were able to talk about the Lord and the scriptures and to pray for one another. And one of those people is... a. a a devout Catholic, but I, I have no uh, reservation whatsoever of her love for the Lord Jesus Christ. She loves Jesus, and she is a follower of Jesus to the best of her ability. And she knows the scriptures, was able to um, <laughs> repeat them back to us, and we were able to talk about the scriptures and the things of God. How big is your hour? Years ago, I had a call when we had the school here, we had kindergarten through eighth grade, and I got a call from one of the parents one day, one of um, the moms in the school, and she was uh, very upset and very concerned, and she asked me, do you believe that um, your church is the only church going to heaven? <laughs> I said, by no means. Uh, heaven's going to be an awful small place, <laughs> if that's what I believe. And I said, uh, furthermore, half of our ch uh, teachers don't attend church here, so um, I'm not expecting them to go to heaven either. You know, I mean, it was just, you know, an attack of the enemy trying to divide uh, and conquer us. And so I, I, I spoke to her and put her at rest that, no, I believe that the body of Christ is much bigger than Calvary Christian Church. So we have to have purity of doctrine. Uh, we have to pursue purity of doctrine. James tells us that God's wisdom is first pure then peaceable, right? First pure. So the Lord is concerned about our doctrine. He is concerned about our beliefs. He's concerned about uh, that we know the truth and that we walk in the truth. But you can have purity of doctrine without spiritual unity. You can have purity of doctrine without spiritual unity. Just because you have pure doctrine does not mean it automatically produces spiritual unity. There are churches that have, are sound in faith, but oftentimes, many times, they are un unsound when it comes to love. They might have a grip, a handle on the scriptures and what the, the scriptures say, and they may have a handle on all of their beliefs and have all their doctrines lined up, but they forget to speak the truth in love. 
Paul tells us that we need to speak the truth in love in Ephesians 4.15. Why is it important for the church to have unity? This is the exciting part, at least in my mind. Why is it important? Ephesians 4, verses 1 through 3. I, therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you that you walk worthy of the vocation or of your calling, wherewith you were called, with all lowliness and meekness, with longsuffering, forbearing one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. Why is this important? Because of that big word, therefore. It's not a big word, but it's there. What the Apostle Paul is saying, that if you read the book of Ephesians, and I know I spent some time on it with you, chapters 1 through 3, it's all of the, the blessings of Christ. It is the riches of Christ for the church. It is the chapters 1 through 3 deal with all the blessings, the doctrine of Christ, and then 4, 5, and 6 deal with our responsibilities in Christ. Chapters 1 through 3, the, the major theme in the first half of the book is the wealth of Christ that is available to us believers. And the next half of the book has to do with our walk in Christ, how we are to walk it out, how we are to live it. They are connected to one another. If we're going to walk in the power of Christ, if we're going to walk in the fullness of Christ, if we're going to walk in the riches of Christ, the wealth of Christ, we must walk in unity with one another. With great riches comes great responsibility. So Paul spends the first three chapters explaining the abundance of the Lord's kindness, his blessing that has been poured out upon us in the first three chapters. Paul explains what we must do to walk in that blessing in the last three chapters of the book of Ephesians. It's a beautiful balance between doctrine and duty. Doctrine, the first half of the book, doctrine, 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 what you should believe. The second half of the book is how you should live it out. All of the unsearchable riches of Christ. These are some of the words that Paul uses, the exceeding riches of his grace. His kindness towards us who believe the riches of his glory hinge on us fulfilling or walking according to the remainder of the book. Right? We can't just stop there at chapter 3. Wonderful! Praise God, I got it all! No, we must endeavor to walk in unity with one another. We are seated, according to the first part of Ephesians, we are seated with Christ in the heavenlies. We are in a position of authority and power, all of the abundance of his wealth. Every spiritual blessing has been granted to us in Christ. The exceeding greatness of his power, he says, his mighty power has been put to our account, but our access is connected to the rest of the book, Ephesians 4, 5, and 6. And he starts out with, therefore, walk worthy of your calling, endeavoring to keep, to walk in the spirit of unity. Paul tells us that we must walk in unity. He goes on to tell us in the rest of the book that we must walk in purity, that we must walk in harmony, and that we must walk in victory. But here he focuses on unity, oneness in the body of Christ, the power of unity. If we are all to walk and work and live in unity, unity with our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, and unity with one another, what power would flow from this place? In the Old Testament, the Lord says to Israel, if you obey me, I will bless you. In the New Testament, the tenor is, I have blessed you, now obey me. I have blessed you, now walk by the grace of God in obedience to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. He has given us such a marvelous calling in Christ. Now it is our responsibility by his grace to live up to that calling, to walk in that calling. God is building a body of believers. We are that body. Peter says it this day that we are living stones and that we are being built up into a spiritual house, a holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God by Jesus Christ our Lord. The Lord has reconciled us to himself and to one another by the blood of Jesus. The oneness of believers in Christ 
is a spiritual reality. It is a spiritual reality. However, it is our responsibility to guard it, to protect it, to preserve in it, to walk in that unity. In verses 12 through 13, in chapter 4 of Ephesians, Paul gives in verse 11 the fivefold ministry, right, for the edification of the church. He goes on in verse 12, for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body in Christ, till we all come to the unity of faith, of the knowledge of the Son of God, unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. If we are going to come to the unity of the faith, if we are going to grow up in him, and we, if we are going to grow up unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, if we are going to reach perfection, we must walk in unity. We must walk in unity. If we are going to lay hold of all the spiritual blessings in Christ as a church, we must learn to walk in unity of the Spirit. I mean, we have prayed and I'm sure you have too, you know, ask the Lord to bless us with his presence, with his anointing, with his word, with his power, with his grace. We can't leave out some important ingredients. There is a responsibility in our, our part to guard our unity, to protect our unity, to walk in unity. Psalm 133 makes it very clear. Psalm 133, what I'm saying. He says, Behold, how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. It is like the precious ointment upon the head that ran down upon the beard, even Aaron's beard, that went down to the skirts of his garment, as the dew of Hermon, and as the dew that descended upon the mountains of Zion. For there the Lord commanded the blessing, even life forevermore. Notice that before the anointing, before the dew of heaven, before the blessing, and before life, there is unity. How good it is for brethren to walk in unity. Unity opens the door for God's blessing. Unity opens the door for his anointing. Unity opens the door for his grace and his power and his might and his spiritual blessings. It is unity, oneness in, in the Lord. If we are going to preserve the unity of the Spirit, we must possess some necessary graces in our lives. Going back to verse 3, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. Notice that, jumping ahead of myself again, endeavoring. It's not a, a once and for all decision. I'm going to do that. There, now I have unity. <laughs> it is a work. That The verb there is the continuous present tense, which means that you endeavor, and you endeavor, and you endeavor, and you endeavor to keep the spirit of unity. It is something that we all are responsible for and something that we are all supposed to work at. Work at keeping the unity of the Spirit. So in Ephesians 1, he says, I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you that you walk worthy of the vocation wherewith you were called with all lowliness. This is how we maintain it. This is how we work it out. Lowliness and meekness and long-suffering, forbearing one another in love endeavoring to keep the unity of spirit and the bond of peace. We must have humility. We must have humility and lowliness. A means by, again, keeping that unity. What does humility mean? Basically, it means put Christ first, others second, and yourself last. When's the last time that any of us did that? Others, Christ first, others second, and self last. Unity is cultivated by esteeming others as better than yourself. It's the same mind of Christ that is described for us in Philippians chapter 2, verses 1 through 8. Humility is necessary for unity. Uni unity will not grow 
It will not grow. That means it will not prosper. The gifts will not flow in an atmosphere of pride, of judgment, of a critical attitude. Unity will not grow if we're always pointing at the speck in our brother's eye while ignoring the beam in our own eye. Humility or lowliness of mind was really looked down upon by the Greeks. Humility was not something to be valued by their society. It was not a sought after attribute. The Greeks were a proud people. They were a prideful people, prideful of their democracy and their citizenship and their rights. And humility was associated with servanthood or with being a slave. Humility was dis devalued as an attribute or as a characteristic that someone should possess. However, our Lord and Savior said, he being the son of man, that he was meek and lowly in heart. He also said that the son of man came that not to be ministered unto, but to minister and to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many, to minister and to serve. He was lowly. He was the one that was found washing the other disciples' feet or the, the disciples' feet. Humility is truly a product of seeing God clearly, of his, his greatness and his majesty and his holiness and his beauty, and looking at ourselves clearly, who we are, looking into the, the mirror of God's, of God's word and seeing all the imperfections and all the shortcomings that we do say, woe is me, woe is me. And that gives us grace for our brethren, doesn't it? Gives us grace when we see uh, the, our imperfections and our shortcomings and uh, how far short we fall of the glory of God. Uh, when someone steps on our toe, eh, no big deal, right? And it gives us grace to see the shortcomings and the faults of others. Spurgeon said, if any man thinks ill of you, do not be angry with him, for you are worse than he thinks you to be. <laughs> if he charges you falsely on some point, yet be satisfied, for if he knew you better, he might change the accusation, and you would be no gainer by the correction. You'd be no better off by the correction. If you have your moral portrait painted and it is ugly, be satisfied, for it only needs a few blacker touches, and it would be nearer to the truth. Ouch. For us to have unity, we must walk in meekness, right? Meekness is not weakness. It is power under control. Moses was a meek man, the scripture tells us in Numbers 12, 3, yet he had tremendous power leading the people. Jesus Christ was meek and lowly in heart, and yet he was the same Jesus who was meek and lowly in heart was the same Jesus who drove the money changers out of the temple. Meekness is not weakness. In the Greek language, the word meekness was used for soothing lotion or medicine or a cult that had not been ridden upon or had not been broken, sorry. A soft wind. In each case, you have power but that power was under control, like gentleness, the fruit of the Spirit, gentleness. Meekness is strength under control. It is self-control. It is refraining from retaliation to bear under the irritation and the faults of others. It is giving others time to grow in the grace and the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ, giving others room to grow. I mean, I don't feel the need to go around and, and slapping people in the back of the head saying, hey, straighten up. You give them grace to grow. Grace to grow in the knowledge in the Lord Jesus Christ. Meekness is gentleness. Meekness is strength under control. Uh, not too long ago, my, uh, my wife, Chris, she had a, um, a conference to go to, and it was up in Traverse City. And it was at this place where they had golf courses. And it was last fall, and I said, whoa, I'll go with you. So we, <laughs> not to the conference, to the golf course, right? So we drove all day up there, well, like whatever, four hours, 
Yeah, found a place to park. It was packed. Found a place to park my car. And the guy that was I parked next to, his car was over the line. You know, so I pulled up as close as I could to him uh, so that my back end would not be sticking out. But anyways, parked the car. We ran into um, the hotel room and, and, you know, got our reservations, unpacked our clothes, and then we were going out to dinner. So we come back out to dinner, and there's a guy under my car. Uh, under the front of my car, and I said, uh, can I help you? And he jumps up, you hit my car! And I'm like, what? You hit my car! I can't believe you hit my car! And I'm like, I, I, if I hit your car, <laughs> I didn't even notice. But immediately, I began to swell up. I'm getting angry. Whoa! You know, <laughs> you young buck, I'm, uh, you know, tear you apart limb by limb. And, and so I, I feel myself, I'm getting angry, and I'm getting upset. You hit my car, I can't believe you hit my car. And I, I, I said, you know, and I, uh, my reaction, I probably can't do it, but it was one of anger initially. And I said, okay, okay, you know, if, if I did hit your car, I'm very sorry. Um, I mean, it was, if we did hit your car, we didn't even notice it. Uh, to be honest, my wife and I, we didn't even notice if I touched your car, I'm, you know, very sorry. Well, you need to be more careful next time. You know, it's pretty hard to have a 20-year-old yell at you <laughs> and take it. That's meekness. And so he jumped in his 10-year-old rusty Subaru and drove away. <laughs> I thought, well, maybe he was worried that I was going to knock some of the rust off and the car would fall apart. I don't know. Meekness. If we're going to have unity, we need to walk in meekness. Next, the Apostle Paul brings up long suffering which uh, basically means to suffer long, right? To be long-tempered, to suffer long, to endure discomfort without fighting back, to suffer long. Again, giving people the opportunity to grow in the grace and the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. One of the things that the Lord said about himself, that he was slow to anger, long-suffering. Slow to anger, abounding in love, forgiving sin and iniquity to thousands. Slow to anger, being patient, showing tolerance for one another in love, allowing others to grow in the grace of God, enduring the faults and the shortcomings of others, giving people room to grow in grace. The Apostle Paul tells us of himself that he was one that travailed in prayer. In the book of Galatians, chapter 4, 19, that he travailed in, in birth again until Christ was formed in them. Again, he's travailing, and he's praying, and he's worried, and he's concerned that Christ will be formed in them, praying for others. Forbearance as well, which is a grace um, that can't be experienced apart from love. Love suffers long and is kind. I know usually we share that verse, uh, 1 Corinthians 13, at a marriage ceremony, but that's speaking to us, the body of Christ. Love suffers long and is kind. Paul is actually describing, right, the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, long-suffering, or patience, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance, self-control. Against there, such there is no law. A believer who is walking in the Spirit will maintain the unity of the Spirit. A believer walking in the Spirit will maintain the unity of the Spirit with others. Unity is fostered through loving tolerance of one another. And it's not natural. At least it's not natural with me. I don't know about you. Uh, I think probably all of us since the fall are more self-centered than other-centered, right? We care about ourselves, worry about ourselves, our wants, needs, desires. And then if I got time left over or money left over, I'll think about someone else. It is not natural to live in unity, but unity, our, unity must be intentional, right? Endeavoring. That means you are intentional in keeping the unity. You are working at it. You are working on it. And that means you're working on yourself, right? Allowing God to work in you so that you can live in unity with others. It's not pointing at the speck in someone else's eye, but it is looking at and acknowledging the plank in your own eye and asking God to remove it so that you can walk in unity. Endeavor, it means to maintain, to keep, to guard that unity of the Spirit. It's in the continuous present tense. That means it's constantly something that we are endeavoring to do. Not like um, I spent some time in Texas, and uh, 
they would always say, well, I'm fixing to go to the store. That meant he was going to the store. I don't know why they would say that. I'm fixing to do this, fixing to do my homework. Man, he was going to do his homework. It's not that. It's not that you're fixing to do it. You're endeavoring to do it. You're working on it. You're cognizant about it. You're thinking about it. You're, you are working towards it. Just like a couple needs to work. Um, it, it takes much more um, long suffering uh, to work on a marriage than it does to get up and say, I do, at the ceremony takes patience and kindness and meekness and gentleness from both parties, right, in a marriage. So spiritual unity of the home, Sunday school class, church, is the responsibility of each person. Each person involved needs to take a responsibility to keep the unity the and the peace or the bond of peace. We need to be those that are working on it in the Lord Jesus Christ. One of the crowning jewels of the saints of God is to be our unity and our love for one another. If we want the gifts to flow, if we want to grow in the grace and the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ, if we want to grow in the fullness of the measure of the stature of Christ, we need to endeavor to keep the unity in the bond of peace. Amen? Amen. Let's stand. Paul tells us in Colossians 3.15, He says, let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to the which also you were called in one body, and be thankful. In Galatians 6, 2, he says, bear one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. Bear one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. I want people... When they look at you and they look at me and they look at Calvary Christian Church, they say, wow, those people are unique, living in unity, loving one another, that the world may know that Jesus Christ is the Savior of the world. Amen. Amen. Heavenly Father, I thank you, Lord, for the work that you've done on the cross of Calvary for us to redeem us, to save us, to deliver us but also, Lord, to bring us into the wonderful, precious blessings that you have reserved for us, O God. Lord, help us, O God, to walk in unity so that we will keep the faith with one another, that we be submitted to one another in the fear of God, that we would look out for the interests of others, Lord, and that your life and your light and your glory would be seen in this body of believers that people would look at us and see our love for one another and that they would know that you rule and reign in our hearts and that you have saved us and redeemed us and that you are the savior of the world. Lord, I pray that you would answer the prayer that you, you prayed back in John 17. Lord, that we would be one. As you and the Father are one, that we would be one with you and one with one another. I ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.